Hey, lovely people, how are you doing? So I've put together a little presentation for those interested in the link between the dartboard, the clock, and the astronomical clock. Now, uh, a clock, what is it really? In the Middle Ages, people listened to the bells. They told the time from the bells. And if they wanted to know what the time was, they went up to the, the clock on the church tower. Now, um, in the previous video, we showed that this dartboard is uh, derives from the clock, possibly a, a sort of divin divinatory purpose. We're going to look at how this is an astronomical clock, how all clocks are astronomical clocks. Sundials are, of course, astronomical clocks. And we're going to look at that amazing clock in Mantua. The clock in Mantua is um, just extraordinary, just uh, beautiful. Once you see how that works, you'll see how any clock works. Now, uh, this is uh, just incredible. You'll have a new appreciation of, 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 of the culture and understanding of, of the world in Middle Ages I, just by watching this video. And I'm going to ask you a few questions because there's a lot of things I don't know that I can't find the answers to. So I'd like some of the answers in the comments. Now, in a previous video, we saw that this is um, the dartboard is, is based on base 20, which is, of course, based on Jupiter and Saturn coming together and flying apart every 20 years. It's kind of a cosmic version of sex. So it's something that would have been venerated and worshipped. Um, the Dogon said uh, that Jupiter and Saturn are the placenta of the solar system. This is what rebirths the solar system, rebirths the world. So they celebrated 30-year periods, and they celebrated 60-year periods. And this is what was celebrated at Stonehenge, 30 and 60, in the number of uh, the Aubrey holes, the number of the X and Y holes at 30, and the number of Jupiter and Saturn conjugations, as I uh, pointed out in the previous video, is 40 over 800 years, which makes one cycle. And this is the the, the, the 40 holes we, we see also at Stonehenge, uh, which were filled by the blue stones. Now, in this, obviously, it's from a clock. No one talks about this. No one knows this. No one's Why aren't people curious enough? Thank you for being curious enough to watch this video, by the way. But why aren't people curious about this? They just want to know, oh, Egypt's interesting. The rest is throw it out in the bin. You know, um, but anyway. We can see this used to be a clock because it, the top is the top number, like in the, the number of a, a clock, the 12 on the clock. And, and then it starts from 1. And, of course, this was all scrambled in the past. It looks like it was done in the 19th century or earlier to make it more fair. So if you want high numbers, you, you, you don't aim for the, the quadrant with the high numbers. And that's how that would work. Now, you're going to say, Charlie, I don't believe anything you say. I never do. I just watch you for the fun of it. Uh, prove to me that this is a clock. Okay, I'll prove it. Um, so, uh, this is Nauf, and this is the world's oldest sundial. Wikipedia says this is the world's oldest sundial, 1500 BC, in the sundial article. Now, this shows you how wrong the academics always are. Now, this is 12 segments, so it's Babylonian, and that's a zodiac. There's 12 constellations. Uh, so, this derives from a circular zodiac, basically, and this is where the shadow falls, of course. This is a very primitive type of sundial, but you see this across medieval Europe because Egypt founded Western civilization. Now, we see the same thing at Nauf. Now, the one at Nauf is about 1,500 to 2,000 years older than the one in Egypt, and we know it's a sundial, but the, the people who wrote the sundial article aren't aware of this. There's the place for the gnomon, and look carefully, look very carefully. Uh, as I pointed out, there are 20 of these, so they had a base 20 uh, astronomical system as seen in the dartboard. In addition, you have an outer ring, the number, an inner ring, the number. Outer ring, the number, inner ring, the number. This is an old astronomical clock. Fascinating, isn't it? And um, there's more. You have circles as well. On the Mantua clock around it, you had circles with gods. Fascinating. That's part of the clock face. Notice they abbreviated some of these circles away in the photo because they don't realize they're part of the clock as well. Um, in a, in a addition, you've got spirals. Now, the spirals come from about 3000 BC. That's how you can date this stuff. Um, you've got the zigzags as well, which was the Dogon counting system, as we pointed out. You have another clock here. It's, 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 it's cogs within cogs almost, which is fascinating. Hey, hey. Isn't this the Mayan system? You have one cogwheel here and then another cogwheel here. And we pointed out so many links between, say, Peru, which is not Maya, but Peru, and the Irish. Just fascinating. Now, um, if you see crosses, that's later, that's later on. 
If you don't see spirals, that's about 5,000 BC, and that's interesting as well. So that's, that's the sundial at Nauf. Now, um, that is of course. Uh, now that is of course. Uh, that's got the circles as well. This dartboard uh, from Bath, um, Patrick Chaplin's website. Hope he doesn't mind, but at least I'm pointing people to it. Here have th it looks like three darts are sticking into it, and. Um, this is fascinating. You've got the 20 near the top and it start, and then, then, then some other numbers and then inner numbers. It's fascinating. Now, you see there's a star here and you see this on clocks as well. Say, uh, B, uh, not, this is not Big Ben, this is in Canada, but you see this star on clocks. And you think, what the hell is a star there? Why is there a Jewish star on that clock? Look, it's not a Jewish star. This is the sun. And this is, this is another clue that this is an astronomical uh, clock. This is an astronomical clock. This dartboard is a clock from a clock. They have the same damn origin. And uh, look, there's a garden sundial with the sun on it. If you don't believe me, that is the sun that you see on the clocks. And um, so if you want to look at the history of clocks, let's look at the history of sundials. So you look up sundial and you find the garden variety sundial. And... Honestly, this is not really what sundials looked like in the Middle Ages. I think these became popular around the Renaissance. There were all there was always a dial, yes, but if you if you were a poor pauper in a town and you wanted to know what time it was, you listened to the bell, you'd know what time it was straight away. And then what you'd do if you really wanted to, if you were really uh, uh, pedantic and autistic, you would actually go up to the clock and watch the sundial ticking, or if you were, or if you were a child. And the sundials looked more like this guy here, which is uh, from the Dark Ages, Ireland. And, and Ireland is amazing because you can see all these monuments uh, in the ground and on the ground from the Dark Ages. Throughout continental, continental non-insular Europe, you never see uh, anything on the ground from the Dark Ages. It's been destroyed. That is a sundial. Fascinating, isn't it? And it's like an early clock dial. Uh, on a stick, a clock on a stick. And this is what sundials looked like. Now, um, if you wanted to be really precise, you would make a convex sundial like this, uh, a concave sundial, and it wouldn't sh it wouldn't elongate the shadows on the sides. So it would give you a, a nice line, and that's why this was done. Uh, obviously, in ancient Greek, ancient Greece, full of geniuses, um, they were the superpower of the ancient world. And, of course, they, they, they were able to do things like this. The modern precise sundials look like this. But what sundials really looked like was something like this in medieval Europe. And it basically, if you're living in Europe today, you'll find this, say, on a building. And you would look at where the line is and you'd say, damn, that's what time it is. And someone said, wow, God made um, a, uh, the shell look like a sundial to give us inspiration. Um, again, sundials look like look something like that, and there's a disc. That one looks like an astrolabe, because they knew about astrolabes back then. Today, we don't know about astrolabes, and again, that's fascinating. Very fascinating there. Morning. So this this church venerated morning and afternoon as different times of day. So this is the earliest clock tower. This is the Tower of the Winds in Greece, and. This is in Athens, sorry. Every city had their own Tower of the Winds. They all look different. Some of them are, are precursors to the gazebo. This one is a precursor to the clock tower. It's got an inside and an outside. On the outside, you have a look at where the lines are falling and this is uh, and where the, where the gods are at that particular time, which gods to worship. And this translated over into medieval times, into Roman times, into medieval Europe. So, we have the thing. So, there's an uh, article on Wikipedia called Astronomical Clock. And the most complicated astronomical clock it would seem is the one in Prague. I've never been there, but it's just beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, you have a 24 hour time around the outside, you have a 24s around the inside as well in Roman letters, in uh, Arabic letters, and here you have the zodiac. Now, I'm going to show you a different clock, the clock in Mantua. And once you understand that clock, you will understand any astronomical clock. So I don't need to show all of them to you. So let's do that. Now, first, another thing. It says astronomical clock, as if that's the only type of astronomical clock, something that shows the zodiac and all this. Look, guys, every damn clock is an astronomical clock. Every single clock is an astronomical clock. Why? Because there's 12 constellations in the zodiac, and this is going around. Anything that's round is referring to astronomy. 
But you notice there's no constellations depicted around this clock. Why? Because our education has changed and that is no longer relevant, but the convenience of having the same number of hours as our ancestors is most convenient indeed. So, this is the astronomical clock in Mantua. And this is just absolutely fascinating. I am really interested in this stuff. And, as I said, the photographer has abbreviated out an essential part of our understanding of the clock which is, and time has abbreviated, um, many, of these, uh, many of these portraits. The ones under the alcove here have been slightly preserved. And you'll notice that a straight line points to the center. I've noticed a straight line points to the center of these portraits, showing this was intrinsic to the function of the clock. Perhaps saints to worship in, in different hours, which is what certain sects, there were four different sects of medieval Christians, were able to do. Mantua, and by the way, an extraordinary city-state. Um, I had a professor who was, has spent her life studying just this one city-state, a small city-state in um, uh, in Italy, run by the Gonzaga, uh, the Gonzaga family, uh, 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 an interesting, a very interesting Renaissance family of great power and wealth and privilege. But let's look at the clock now. That is the clock in Mantua. It's just absolutely beautiful. And uh, now let's look closely. I'll try and explain as best I can, but here's the problem, guys. No one really knows exactly, completely how it works. And if you do, that means you've read an entire treatise which was written about this in Latin, which no one has because no one can read Latin perfectly. It takes a long time. I know people who have been reading Latin 20 years. You give them a book in medieval Latin, they're not going to be able to read it with great speed and they'll have to consult the dictionary quite a lot. So let's see what's going on on this clock. Now, for starters, this hand here is pointing to the old Italian time. There's 24 hours starting from the right-hand side. So one goes all the way around to 24. Here you have the goddess Latona. Latona, uh, first I thought, is this Artemis because the mistress of the animals? But then there's a moon here. She's a moon goddess. So Latona, the moon gave birth to Artemis. Here is the moon phase, and it's pointing to where um, a, an exact date um, on the particular um, uh, 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 zodiac, and it's showing where the moon is in the zodiac and where the moon is in the lunar month. Now, um, apparently, uh, this 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 goes up to 29 to 29 days in Arabic numbers. So that the problem with this is, uh, if you understand how what these exactly what these symbols are and why these symbols are chosen, it's like the random numbers of a dartboard, isn't it? If you can explain this to me, I'd be most uh, grateful. I, I, you look up Lunar Year, it just gives you China, China on Google. I'd be most grateful to you. This points to where the sun is in the sky at this present moment, theoretically. So if you're looking at the clock, that points to exactly where the sun is. Now, here we are looking at, um, here, this is daytime hours in Arabic. This is nighttime hours. How come? Because remember how a sundial needs to be laid out. It's the sun's up here and it's pointing to there's the gnomon and the shadow is falling down there. So um, so that's how we know that that is the daytime and these are the hours of the nighttime. Uh, so isn't it fascinating? Now um, this is also pointing to the sun's uh, position um, theoretically in the zodiac. So this allows you to calculate the ascendant and other things. The ascendant where the sun's rising on a particular day. So that is so uh, in the east. So uh, the constellation the sun is in. And, and this al this allows you to do so, so very much. Theoretically also, um, you, uh, you this allows, this all allows you the calculation of the lunar hours. Now, um, and just on a side note, there's this, there's this green thing going around. Now, I have a theory that's supposed to be Jormungandr, the snake which wrapped around the, the earth. But as you see, they've turned it into a reef, but it's not a reef, is it? It's a, something you don't even see in nature at all. It's it's a kind of garland, and it's sort of wrapped around a, a, a circular frame. But it, they never look like this, do they? So I reckon this was supposed to be a snake, and at secular authorities, uh, per, perhaps on an earlier sundial, you can see there used to be a sundial here before the clock was made. And I can prove that by showing you they've, they've homaged it with this particular sundial-like thing here. So the snake was possibly drawn around that earlier sundial. You know, perhaps it survived from Roman times that there was a snake drawn around a sundial. 
And perhaps this was on Roman sundials. I'm not sure if we have any Roman sundials, but I'm betting there would have been a snake around them because of this feature, which is an homage to the earlier, uh, the, the earlier thing that was there. Uh, in addition, uh, we have here, this is a, a uh, this blue line here shows the, the, uh, the celestial equator. So, so if you look up in the sky, you'll see most of you in the Northern Hemisphere, you look up, you know where Polaris is. And you look up and you'll see the stars there, beautiful, lovely. And between that Polaris and the opposite pole, which you can't see, which is on the other side of the planet, is a celestial equator. And this shows you the constellations, which are um, up in the, the, the at the equator at, at the moment. This is uh, uh, close to the equator. This is fascinating, just fascinating. Um, so you can do so much with this. And apparently, you can do alchemy with this. Um, so how do I know this? Well... Alchemists had to had to uh, uh, so this was actually secretly secretly built for alchemists and no one's saying this they wouldn't say this because alchemy was always frowned upon even back in the day when kings were funding and it was frowned upon. So if you want to mix your ingredients, you have to calculate which particular celestial hour you have to mix them in, where you have to do all this, where you have to collect the ingredients. These are these are called planetary hours, and. The, 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 don't ask me how, but that clock allows you to calculate planetary hours based on uh, uh, the astrology. Now, how to, to know, all you need to know about planetary hours is that Ptolemy said that the days of the week, um, uh, the, the, the planetary uh, system of spheres, are that they go from slowest to fastest moving in the sky. So the hours of the day... Um, are actually go from go by Saturn in this order: Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, Earth. That's the hours of the day. So each hour of the day is a planet. So uh, what happens is um, you're starting on Saturn day because Saturn is the slowest, and and you count down the hours from sunrise. And it looks like maybe the Romans might have come up with this, or it's older than the Romans. And and each hour is a different planet. And maybe this clock, it seems, according to the Wikipedia article, you can calculate planetary hours. And this would allow you, an astrologer, to go up to the clock and see when to mix his ingredients. And you're not going to find this written anywhere, but this is what would have been done. Now, according to the Key of Solomon, I don't recommend you this book. Uh, uh, look, honestly, between you and me, don't tell anyone. I started reading this book. It sounds like it was written by, you, what's the word? You know those... Um, incels you know it sounds like it was written by an incel because it and i just threw it on the ground i couldn't read it it's the most psychopathic thing ever but anyway this is based on ancient alchemy this is based on ancient egyptian black magic um all of this is from i believe ancient egypt now in the days and hours of saturn the summoning of souls from Hades, but only of those who have died a natural death. In the days and hours of Jupiter, what you can do then with your magic is you can obtain honors, acquire riches, contracting friendships, preserving health. Um, in the days and hours of the moon, embassies, voyages, envoys, messages, navigation, reconciliation, love, the acquisition of uh, merchandise by water in the hours of the moon, making trial of experiments relating to recovery of stolen property for obtaining nocturnal visions for summoning spirits in sleep, and for preparing anything in relation to water. So, this is when you do your spells. So, that calendar allows, it's, it, it's helping you with spell casting. So, I, I could call it the spell casting calendar. Let's make this the name of the video. And, you know, this goes on and on and on. So, I'm going to read you a bit about this. Now, this is a brilliant book, but you can see academics have an incomplete understanding an incomplete understanding. If you're a Renaissance academic, you're not going to understand how mathematics, how astronomy works. Um, so I'm just going to, what I want to do, I, I just to give you a bit of the cultural background, this is artsandculture.google.com and they want people to see it. So I'm sure they won't mind if I read a bit from it. So here we go. The Astronomical Clock of Mantua. And this is fascinating, just for a bit of background so you understand where, how this all came about. Piazza Erba today is the centre of Mantua, but once upon a time it belonged to the very first suburb of the Virgilian city, whose oldest nucleus was located where Piazza Sordello is located. Its beauty is largely due to buildings raised or restored over the centuries, from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance and beyond. In particular, the Tower of the Clock was built in the year 1473 as a completion of the Palace of Reason, where politics and justice were administered in the era before the Gonzaga family took power over Mantua. The author of the tower is Luca Fancelli, the Tuscan of Settignano, who 
uh, decided so much about the view of Mantua, carrying out the indication of, of Leon Battista Alberti. However, the imposing statue of the Immaculate Virgin Mary and the source of the moon, the balcony, and the upper crown were added later. The 15th century appearance of the tower and the square probably can be derived from an ornate wooden artwork of the Cathedral of Cremona, created by Giacomo Maria de P uh, Piedena called Il Platina. Here stands out the stylized figure of an astronomical clock invention of the genius of Bartolomeo Manfredi. He was, the f he was first a mathematician, John of the Clock Sun. Now, this explains a bit what's going on here. Now, astronomical clocks had spread mainly in Northern Europe already during the 14th century. In Italy, the oldest is certainly located in Padua, which today overlooks Piazzo de Signori, but uh, which came at least as a conception, at least from the lost Regina Carrarese. The astronomical clock of Mantua is the second built in Italy in order of time, and the first one that today we can see in the site for which it was conceived. Luckily, the construction of the clock is documented in a letter from Manfredi and illustrated in a text printed by Pietro Ademo de Micheli. So we have a precious testimony. Now this 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 tells us the details, but you can see academics don't really know. So 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 he, so we have a precious testimony of the original purposes of the mechanism of its way of pointing out the astronomical astrological time, and also the astronomical culture that in the Renaissance was so influent. Manfredi's clock has at least eight effects. Here we list them synthetically. First effect: let the people know how many hours have passed since sunset. So that's that it would seem, or, or probably that one there. Um, second effect, to show the zodiacal sign in which the sun is in. So that's clearly there. Third effect, to show if the moon is new or full. That's there. Fourth effect, to make it possible the calculation of the ascendant. That is an astrological technical detail of the highest importance to infer the influence of the stars at an exact moment. So this is how academics write when they don't know what they're talking about. So they're saying the ascendant was very important, and it's a, it's a complex calculation done to know many things. So in other words, this academic doesn't know those things, which is a pity. It's a pity that people don't know anymore, you know. We, we're not learning the science of the ages. Fifth effect, to describe uh, which one between the seven known celestial bodies, Sun, Mercury, Venus, Moon, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, reigns at some time. Sixth effect, so that's the planetary hour. Sixth effect, knowing the particular hours, of, and, and they don't show how that works because they don't know. And in fact, I don't know. But if you know, tell me. Sixth effect, knowing the particular hours of the Mantuans, each one marked with a sound. In fact, there were six different bell sounds dividing the day. Seventh effect, to know how many hours have passed after midday. Eighth effect, to understand how long the daytime part or the night part of a certain day were. Wow. The astronomer Bartolomeo Manfredi wrote this letter on the 29th of June, 1473. Isn't it amazing we can have letters from people 500 years ago? To inform the Marquis Ludovico Gonzaga that he had come, that he, this was the ruling body of Mantua, the Gonzaga family, that he completed the astronomical clock. After that, he describes the features of his invention. Not only it marks the hour, but also tells the people the useful days for the various daily work and the critical days in which various infirm in infirmities are possible. It is now possible to put it on the tower to let it come to the pleasure of illustrious lord of mine, for whom I swear eternal loyalty and give me lots of money, probably. This letter is now preserved in the state archives of Mantua, which we thank for granting us the image. The dial of the clock, restored on 25th October 1989, thanks to Alberti uh, Gawler's mastery, can be described starting from its center. The, the figure shining in the middle is, according to Pietro Adamo de, de Micheli, the mythological mother of Diana or Apollo, the moon and the sun. He says it because he claims that her name, Latona, was written above her. So Also, if its attributes are typical of Diana, yes, she seems like a mistress of uh, the beast. The crescent moon is on top of her head which we see there, and on the side she has a gentle fawn. Next to the left side, left hand is indicated the moon phase. Uh, from the same hand there is a golden ray, which indicates the sign of the zodiac where the moon is on the right hand. Armed with a falcon, indicates the day of the lunar cycle. That's there. 
Uh, and it goes on and on. Now, here, here it says, now, they don't know what this is. So what this dial is, I don't know how that dial works. It's like a dartboard with random numbers going around it, as I showed you. Now, Latona is surrounded by a first record of 29 lunar days in Arabic numerals. And a second record of... Tw See, that's all it says. And a second record of... Tw it doesn't say why they seem to be randomized or where the starting point is or anything. Um, because they don't know. Each sign is then characterized by six shields which divide it uh, five degrees to fi uh, five degrees to five degrees. So the shields are basically uh, tiny little things around here. These are shields. So a hand marked by the sun symbol. That's this thing. That's that's this thing here. Indicates the zodiac sign of the day. We can see also 24 painted bands, 12 white and 12 black, corresponding to daytime and nighttime. That's that's this here. In the middle there is a blue semicircle fixed in the zodiac from the first degree of Libra to the last of Pisces. It's Libra to Pisces. Uh, yeah, something like that. Um, to represent the celestial equator. Finally, the essential part of the dial is distinguished by the 24 hours of the day painted by Latin letters. That's around the outside. Uh, which naturally correspond to the vulgar hours indicated by another appropriate hand. So the vulgar hours are... Um, uh, just the numbers, whereas uh, the say the, the Latin monks had different hours. For example, um, uh, nonnas was noon. They would do certain activity at noon. Um, evening they called it vespers. Vespers was for prayers. It, the, the medieval monks are uh, living like the Muslims of today. It's, it's as if they they haven't really changed um, in the Muslim world and in the medieval. We, we've become secular in Europe. We've sort of sort of abandoned all this tradition. So we don't. This isn't relevant to us in as it once was. A little bit more. In December 1473, in Mantua, it was printed a little book in which the Mantuan Pietro Adamo de Michele described the functions, the purpose, and the symbolism of the astronomical clock. He has been called a singular character indeed. Now, uh, whenever you see singular, this person's been reading a lot of 19th century literature. It just means unique. That is a very unique person. You, you won't meet anyone like them. Now, he studied law in Ferrara, but was also largely self-taught. As an author, we know only this text, which offers him the opportunity to demonstrate his lyric quality and his undoubted scientific and technical knowledge. Pietro Adamo was also the first man to a publisher, leading to printing in 1472 a Tractatus Maleficorum and later the Decameron. So this publisher was himself very much polymath, very interested in how this thing works and functions. And look, I'll leave the rest to you. You can read it. It's fascinating. It goes on and on. I've read half of it. But let's continue the video. So now here's the thing. If you want to know more about how that works, uh, Jeffrey Chaucer wrote in English. A, tr a treatise on the astrolab. This is an armillary sphere or a circular astrolab. I recommend, um, I want to get one of these and I also want to get this an armillary sphere. I want to get an astrolab as well and I want to see how they work and use them. And he wrote about 40 different uses for his type of astrolab. So this was something people played around with like a Rubik's Cube in the Middle Ages. And because we no longer understand this, we no longer do the quadrivium education, which is astrology, music, geometry, and um, I think I believe um, they didn't do mathematics. They did geometry and uh, philosophy or, or theology. It, it, they were no longer doing the trivium and the quadrivium, which was basically like a science and arts degree of today. The, the quadrivium uh, allowed you to uh, be a scientist uh, in the Pythagorean sense, <laughs> sort of understand the universe. Because we no longer learn this anymore, what's happened is that we don't know how to read this damn clock. And isn't that a pity? I hope you've really enjoyed this video. I've enjoyed researching this. We might look at other astronomical clocks in the future, but I really wanted to make a video about astronomical clocks. I saw the one in Wrocław, former Breslau in Poland. It also had weird symbols on them. I didn't know what the weird symbols were. Obviously a lunar calendar. This lunar calendar obviously popular in Europe in the Middle Ages. Try Googling it. You can't find the damn thing. Tell me about it. Tell me about the video. Yeah, I know it's not professional. Thanks for telling me. People are telling me this in every damn video. Oh, it needs to be more professional, unsubscribing. Guys, I'm not here to make videos. I'm here to give information, all right? Cheers, guys. Love you all.